everybody, welcome back to my channel and today's video is my first proper true crime Tuesday video. Obviously last week I posted a video about the Wayfair scandal and all of that stuff that's been going on online but this week is the first sort of proper video in my true crime series. I'm really interested in true crime, it's just something that I really like looking into, I find it fascinating and heartbreaking all at the same time. So I just thought it seemed like something that makes sense to start filming these kind of videos. So I'm starting off today. I've got a really interesting case that I've been looking into and it's actually something that I'd never heard of before, which I just find mad because it's such a crazy case. And it is the case of Abraham Shakespeare. Abraham Lee Shakespeare was the youngest of four siblings and he was born on the 24th of April, 1966 in Sebring, Florida. He didn't really have the best upbringing and sort of start to his life and he struggled a lot throughout school which meant that he ultimately dropped out of school just after the seventh grade which means he just didn't finish his education and that really affected his reading and writing so he was actually pretty much illiterate at the point of leaving school which meant that he never learned how to read or write. And it's really important to remember that later on in the case too. After he dropped out of school, he actually went to live with his dad, James Shakespeare, and he worked with him in the Citrus Groves, which was a huge job opportunity in Florida at the time. It was a massive industry. So he went and worked with his dad doing that. But at age 13, he actually got sent to a reform school, like a juvenile detention center for theft. And he actually stayed there until he was 18 years old. After he left the reform school, he kind of just laid low for a while. He wasn't into getting in trouble. He was just after a nice, easy lifestyle. He wasn't one to cause a fuss. He never did drugs. He didn't really drink alcohol. He used to hang out in like the local areas in the town. So he would be seen at bars and clubs and things like that, but he was never getting into trouble. He was never drinking and doing wild things. He was just pretty chilled, a pretty chilled guy. In 1998, he had his first child. He had a son named Moses with Antoinette Andrews, who he had known since childhood. And they were a little bit on again, off again, but the majority of the time they got on really well. And he absolutely adored his son. He would have done anything for Moses and everybody that knew him said he was a really devoted father and he just absolutely worshiped the ground that Moses walked on. In 2005, at age 84, Abraham's father, James, actually passed away from heart failure and Abraham was living with him at the time. So after he passed away, he moved back in with his mother in a small house in Lakeland, Florida. For his whole life, Abraham always really struggled to find work. Obviously, he had a lack of education, so without being able to read or write, it made finding a job very difficult. So the majority of the time, he would get day labour jobs, so like pot washing or loading trucks, that kind of job, until one of his friends, Greg Smith, who ran a local barber shop, he offered him a job there, so he would like sweep the floors and just look after the shop in between customers. And... He seemed to really enjoy that. Greg was a really good friend of his and it just seemed to be working out really well until he all of a sudden just stopped showing up at that job and Greg Smith learnt that he'd actually left the job when he saw him drive past on a sanitation truck and he'd got a job doing that instead. But that job also didn't last that long. But having so many unpredictable jobs and not knowing how long you're going to be in a job for, it made paying child support to Moses' mum, Antoinette, very difficult and he was always missing payments not because he wanted to because obviously he loved his son and would have paid anything for him but it was just difficult when he didn't know when he was going to be getting money so he ended up owing quite a lot of money that he was just unable to pay on the 15th of november 2006 abraham and a guy called michael ford got a job to do so they drove from where they were to miami and on the way there they decided to stop at Town Star Convenience Store in Frostproof, Florida. Michael Ford got out of the truck and asked Abraham if he wanted anything from inside, like a soda, because he was going inside to get a drink and some cigarettes. And Abraham said he didn't want a drink, but he just wanted two lottery tickets. 
and Abraham apparently only had five dollars on him that day so he gave Michael two dollars towards the cost of the lottery tickets because that's all he had on him. So later that night obviously Abraham was watching the lottery being drawn because he had two tickets in it and he could not believe his luck when his numbers came up and he just found out that he won the 30 million dollar jackpot. Obviously he shared the news with some of his family and some of his friends. He also called up Greg, his friend that worked at the barber shop, as he was really excited with this news and he just couldn't believe that it had happened to him. He also appeared on the news wearing a Florida lottery t-shirt with a couple of his family members and his mum. They were holding up one of those big giant checks that said Abraham Lee Shakespeare Lotto Jackpot. So Abraham was given the option of receiving the $31 million in annual payments. So he would get one payment every year up until a certain point, or he could have taken a $17 million lump sum and get that all in one go. And that is the option that he went for. He chose the 17 million lump sum. And after he paid tax on that, it came out at around $12.3 million ish. Obviously because he'd been on the news with all of this amazing lottery talk going on about him. The child support that he owed to Antoinette obviously came up and he was forced to pay $9,000 straight away, which obviously he didn't mind. He now had the money and he could afford to give money to Antoinette for their child, which he obviously, he was more than happy to do that. He actually set up a million dollar trust fund for Moses so that he would get that million dollars when he turns 18, which is a really nice thing to do for his son. So at this time, Abraham was the talk of the town and everybody was wanting to speak to him and it kind of became apparent pretty quickly that a lot of people wanted to use him for his money. He had phone calls from people, people would show up at his house asking for loans, asking for money, for things that they couldn't afford and because he was such a nice guy, he would often just accept that and he would give money out left, right and centre. He paid off mortgages, he paid off people's tax bills, he paid off utility bills, he paid college tuitions, he paid for some funerals and he lent out money to family and friends too, including a $63,000 loan to his friend Greg who had ran into a little bit of financial trouble at the barber shop and Greg said that he didn't want to accept the money but Abraham just wouldn't hear it. He basically forced him to take the money because he was his friend and Abraham was just a really nice guy who wanted to help people out. He did, after a little while, change his phone number a few times because he just got sick of everybody ringing him all the time. So he did get to a point where he was a little bit like, okay, I've done some good deeds, but now just leave me be. <laughs> which I don't blame to be honest, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. He was a really modest guy and he stayed really modest throughout his whole millionaire status. He didn't really buy that much for himself. He did however splash out on a million dollar house in a gated community and it was a really really nice house. It was a two-story house with four bedrooms, five bathrooms, an outdoor pool with a waterfall feature, a spa, a huge fireplace, walk-in closets, and a two-car garage as well. Gara garage? I don't even say it like that, I say garage. And a two-car garage as well. And he definitely needed space for parking cars because he did actually buy himself a couple of nice cars. I mean, he was a millionaire now, so can you blame him? He bought a new pickup truck and he also bought a BMW. And a lot of people were a little bit skeptical about this. Obviously he couldn't read and write, he was illiterate, but he managed to pass his driving test around the time of this lottery win because he didn't previously have a driving license. So it's a little bit iffy about how he got the license, but nevertheless, he had amazing cars and <laughs> that was the end of it. Nobody really knows how he got his license, but so he was pretty set up at this point. He had the amazing house, he had the amazing cars, and not long after that, he met Centauria, and they had about a year long romance, and then she got pregnant with Abraham's second child, and she moved into the house, and they were getting along really well. Things were going really well. They did have arguments every now and again because people would be constantly ringing the doorbell to come round and ask for money and they used to argue about that and she used to say, you need to just say no, don't answer the door, it's getting ridiculous. 
but besides that they got on really well for the majority of the time. Now if you remember earlier on in the story the day that Abraham won the lottery he got the tickets from Michael. Michael Ford was the one that went into the store to buy the lottery tickets for Abraham and came out and gave them to him but Abraham did give him money towards them. So obviously Michael saw what was happening and he thought I deserve to have some of that money because technically I bought the tickets so where's my share? So he went to Abraham and he demanded some money, he demanded a share of his winnings and Abraham said no. So Michael actually sued him and he claimed that Abraham stole the tickets from Michael's wallet when they were in the truck but the jury didn't believe this and they threw out the case because they just didn't believe his version of events. However, he did appeal it and it was going on for a really long time, but ultimately it never ended up coming down to anything. Ever since he got the lump sum, he was giving out money straight away and obviously he struggled in school and left early, so he wasn't the best at working out what he was paying and how much he had left. At one time he even told his brother that he would have been better off broke, which is really sad to think about because he just won the lottery, you should be absolutely ecstatic, but he was just feeling at the point where everyone was using him and he just thought, I would have been better off if I'd have had no money. So initially some of his friends were trying to help him keep track of his money, but he thought it would be a better idea if he sort of got more of an advisor, like somebody who knew what they were talking about. This advisor was Doris Emma Donegan, otherwise known as Dee Dee Moore. Dee Dee was born on the 25th of July 1972 and she grew up in Riverview, Florida. Her mum described her childhood as gleeful and basically just said that she had a really normal upbringing, she was in a loving family, just as normal as you can be. She was in a brownie group when she was younger that went on to be the Girl Scouts and she was also in a Bible study group which was called the Missionettes. She regularly attended church and she was described as ambitious, outgoing and bubbly. Things started to change a little bit when Dee Dee started high school. She started to notice that she didn't have as much money as her friends did and as her peers did in the school. She started requesting that her parents drop her off around the corner so that nobody would see the family car. She was clearly embarrassed about her parents' lack of money in comparison to some of the people she knew and she just really, really hated that. Once she finished school, she trained to be a nursing assistant and she started doing that from the age of 19. And as well as that, she would often work a couple of jobs alongside because she just wanted to make as much money as she could so she would do like call centre jobs alongside her nursing job. She did actually commit a few crimes in her early life. She was convicted of theft and also false reporting of a crime and she declared herself bankrupt in 2002. So back to current time and Abraham and Dee Dee have just met. She initially introduced herself by saying that she was really happy to be meeting him, she'd heard a lot about him and she really wanted to write a book about his story, about his lottery win and about his life and their first meeting was around two years after his lottery win so a lot had happened and she was really interested in writing a book about his story. During this time Dee Dee was the president of American Medical Professionals and they were a company that would contract out nurses to different areas so if a certain hospital needed some nursing staff for a particular thing she would be in charge of leasing them out to that company. So she was running a really successful company and she was making plenty of money doing it. So all throughout their sort of early friendship she was really keen to show Abraham that she wasn't interested in his money and she had plenty of it. And at this point, sadly, Abraham only had about a million dollars left to his name after receiving $12.3 million just two years before. That really just shows how much he gave out to other people. When you consider the things he bought, there should have been a lot more than that. So Dee Dee really wanted to help him out and that is when they decided to launch a business together so to speak and it was called Abraham Shakespeare LLC and she had full control of the funds. She was 
she was the one that was in control of the business because she was a businesswoman and she knew what she was doing. She also wanted to try and get back some of the money that he had lent out to people. He'd lent out a lot of money and she thought it's not fair that people weren't giving him money back. He had his million dollar house that he needed to upkeep, he needed to pay bills and things and he was going to start struggling with that. So she decided that she would help him get back some of these debts from the people that had borrowed from him. In late 2008, Centauria decided to move out of the big house and they came up with an idea that they were going to sell that house and move into somewhere smaller together. It would have just been more manageable and it would have freed up some of the money as well. So she moved out and that was all going well. And then Dee Dee Moore decided to move herself in to the mansion and she even started renovating it when she moved in. She really made herself at home. Basically everything of Abraham's was then transferred into her company's name, into American Medical Professionals. So all of his debts, assets, property, cars, it was all transferred into the company's name to the point where he didn't even own his house anymore. It was under the name of American Medical Professionals. Then around this time, Abraham sort of went off the radar and people didn't really see him around anymore. He, he just kind of disappeared. Some people just thought that he was laying low and just staying out of trouble. Some people thought that he'd gone on a month long cruise. His family and friends were hoping that he'd taken off with some of his money and was just living life on some Caribbean beach somewhere. And Dee Dee told people that that is what happened. He decided that he couldn't face people asking him for money anymore, so he just decided to leave town. And she wasn't sure where he went. It could have been to Jamaica. It could have been to the Caribbean. She had no idea. Obviously, a little while after he went wherever he went, his family and friends were starting to get a little bit worried that no one had spoken to him so they tried ringing him and texting him but they just never got any response until eventually Abraham did start texting people back and telling them that he had just decided to go out of town and some people did think that that was a little strange because he'd never really texted people before. Remember he couldn't actually spell and he also couldn't read so it made sending texts backwards and forwards a little bit strange. On the 9th of November 2009, Abraham's cousin Cedric reported him missing. He said that he hadn't actually seen him physically in person since April of that year. Cedric told the police that he was a little bit suspicious of what was going on and that his only form of contact with Abraham was through Dee Dee. And he told the police that Dee Dee had actually invited Cedric around to the house and given him a card and told him that Abraham had given this to her for Cedric to pass on to his mother and it had some money in it and a little letter just to say that he was fine but he was living out of town and he didn't want to be disturbed. So as far as Cedric knew, this letter had come from Abraham and he took it round to Abraham's mother Elizabeth but it just seemed a little bit strange. So after he told the police about that, the police were now starting to think, okay, Maybe something is going on here. The police got Dee Dee in just to ask a few questions. Obviously she was someone that was really close to Abraham and she was living with him, so she must surely know something. So they got her in and she said that Abraham had left town. He wasn't interested in seeing anybody. He, he just wanted to be out of the picture. He didn't want to be on anybody's radar. And she also showed the police a videotape that she'd recorded of Abraham, basically saying that he would like to leave town. What do you think? To get a job. Do you get tired of people asking you for money all the time, Abe? Give me your opinion on it. I didn't say a year ago. You guys you just ready to start living your life, huh? They don't take no for a answer, so I just let them keep on and keep on acting. Mm-hmm. Yep. Let's see if we have a video camera.
So where do you want to go to? It don't matter to me. I'm not a picky person. California. You want a foreign country? Really? Cozumel. Hmm? Well, how do you like, how do you like, your, are you going to miss your home? Yep, I miss it, but life goes on. The police were also obviously really curious to know why all of Abraham's assets were now in her company, American Medical Professionals' name. And Dee Dee just explained that as being Abraham wanting to avoid tax. So they put it in that name and she would just give him cash. And she also said that it was because he didn't want to pay child support, so everything was moved out of his name. The police also got in contact and spoke with the attorney who helped with the transferring of Abraham's name onto American Medical Professionals company name. And he said that Abraham was absolutely fine and he actually spoke to him in October. So the police at this point were really thrown through a loop because attorneys are held at the same level as police like they can't lie so if the attorney was saying he spoke to him the previous month in October what's going on they were still a little bit suspicious of Dee Dee at this point and that only got worse when they got a call from Centauria to say that Dee Dee had called her and told her that she would buy her a house and all she had to do in return for this house was ring the police and tell them that she had just seen Abraham. She wanted Centauria to tell the police that Abraham had shown up at her house and they got into an argument through the window and Centauria came out of the house to speak to him and by the time she got outside Abraham had gone. So after this phone call they bring Dee Dee back in and they tell her the good news. They say that Centauria has seen Abraham and that's really good news. It means that he is still alive and well and Dee Dee is thrilled. She's absolutely beside herself with happiness that somebody else has seen him so all of this will just go away. That is until the investigator asks her if she ever offered to buy somebody a house and Dee Dee was obviously taken aback by that statement and she said no but then she realises that it's obvious that they know something so she admits to it. So by now they are pretty much convinced that Dee Dee has something to do with this disappearance. So they go as far as to check her phone record. They notice that since April, which is when the last physical sighting of Abraham happened, they notice that every phone call since then, from Abraham's phone to Dee Dee's phone, it always pings from the exact same tower, coming from the same direction. Meaning that the phones are pretty much next to each other every single time this happens. So now they're pretty confident that it is Dee Dee that is sending these texts and making these phone calls. So they get her in again to question her and show her these phone records and just get her to explain what's happening. And she admits that it is her that's been doing it. But the reason that she did this was because Abraham gave her his phone before he left town and he asked her to pretend to be him and to send messages to people whenever anybody asked where he was or that they were worried about him. He wanted her to respond, pretending to be him, just to make people know that he was okay, but he wasn't gonna be coming back for a while. Then on the 24th of November, 2009, Abraham was officially declared a missing person. And Dee Dee, by this time, was starting to get pretty worried that the police were getting suspicious of her. And she doesn't know what to do. So she makes contact with Greg Smith, who is Abraham's friend from the barber shop. And he meets up with her and she is crying and she's visibly upset. And she tells Greg that she doesn't know what to do because people are gonna start suspecting her for having some involvement in Abraham's disappearance. And he's not really sure why she's stressing about that. He kind of tells her to calm down. And she says that it will help things if he can pretend to be Abraham and ring Elizabeth, Abraham's mother, and tell her that he's fine and everything is okay, but he has chosen to leave town. And she said that she would give him $300 to do this for her. So because Greg believed this and believed her story that Abraham was fine and he just wanted to be out of town, 
he thought he would help Dee Dee. And so Dee Dee took Elizabeth out to a restaurant, a noisy restaurant, so that she wouldn't be able to hear the phone call that well. Greg then called her, pretending to be Abraham, and told her that he was absolutely fine. But after he did this, Greg also started to become suspicious of Dee Dee, because every time he tried to ring Abraham, or every time he tried to text him, he would never get a call back, he would always just get a vague text, which was, again, very unusual for Abraham. If you knew Abraham, then you know that he doesn't text people because he can't spell and he can't read, so it, it doesn't make any sense. He would always just call people, and Greg knew this. Because the police have been suspicious of Dee Dee since pretty much the beginning of this, she was actually under surveillance all the time, and the police were actually watching when she handed over $300 to Greg Smith. So now the police are a bit concerned about what Greg Smith has got to do with this. So after he got his $300, the police actually intercepted him when he was leaving, and they got him to go to the police station. But they had a special request for him. They told him about their suspicions of Dee Dee, and they told him that they wanted him to help them get information and find out what happened to Abraham. And at first, Greg was really unsure about this. He didn't want to be a snitch. He didn't want to be seen to be helping out the police, but he also really cared for his friend. And ultimately he knew that if the tables were turned, Abraham would have helped him. So it was the least that he could do. So the next time that Dee Dee wanted to meet up with him, the police got him to wear a wire under his shirt. But obviously Dee Dee was extremely paranoid and he got into the car, into her car to speak to her and she started patting him down because she was paranoid that anybody she spoke to was gonna be wearing a wire. And he was wearing a wire, so he was freaking out a little bit. He managed to get away with it and she didn't realize anything was going on, luckily but he decided that he wasn't gonna risk doing that again. And he came up with a better idea of how he could secretly record their conversations. Greg used to drink a lot of Red Bull and he came up with an idea of cutting the edge, the top edge of the can off and putting a little microphone inside and then sealing it back up. And they tested it out and it seemed to work really well. So he placed it right in the center console of his car and he just used to put his cigarettes out into it. So it looked as though it was just an ashtray. So no one would pick it up and be interested in it. It would just be something that he would generally have in his car. The next time that Dee Dee wants to meet up, they meet up in Greg's car and she starts to tell him about a guy called Ronald who was a drug dealer and he used to ring Dee Dee up and threaten her and tell her that he was sat outside her son's school and if she told anybody about this then he would kill her son and she said that she was pretty sure that Ronald must have killed Abraham. So by this point she is really worried about what Ronald is going to do and she's pretty convinced that Ronald must have killed Abraham, but she doesn't want to have any evidence linked back to her. She doesn't want to risk being involved in this in any way. Boy, I never know about you anyway. I never give you up. You know what I'm saying? That, Ever. Man, listen, I'm so deep in this shit with you right now. If you go down, I go down right now. So she somehow ropes Greg into meeting her in a motel where she has a laptop and she's wearing gloves and she decides it's a good idea to type up a letter to be delivered to Elizabeth, Abraham's mum. Again, just telling her that he is fine and that he just won't be back in town for a while. So Greg does as he's told and he puts it in Elizabeth's mailbox, but obviously he is working with the police and they intercept the letter before she ever gets to see it. And this all just adds further fuel to the fire that Dee Dee has massive involvement in this case. So on the 6th of January 2010, Dee Dee Moore is officially named a person of interest in the investigation of the disappearance of Abraham Shakespeare. So by now she is well and truly panicking and she tells Greg that Ronald killed Abraham and he is now framing her for this murder. And she needs to come up with a plan to get out of it. 
and to not be framed for it. So Greg says that he has a really good idea. His idea is to involve somebody and get them to take the fall for it. So she is like, oh my God, that's an amazing idea. How can we do that? So Greg introduces her to the fall guy who is his cousin and his cousin is going to be spending the next 25 years of his life in prison for a drug deal. However, this cousin is actually an investigator who is working the case, but obviously Dee Dee doesn't know that. So they meet up, all three of them, and they discuss how this is gonna work, and the fall guy tells Dee Dee that he would accept $50,000 to be paid to his family after he's been sent down for this crime, and he will take the fall for the murder of Abraham. But obviously he wants to know what happened and how he was killed and where the body is because if he's going to take the fall for it he needs to know these details if they ask him how it happened and he said he drowned when really he was shot obviously the police aren't going to believe this story so he needs to know what happened to make this believable so Dee Dee agrees to this she says that she will show them where Ronald buried Abraham and that she can also get her hands on the gun that was used to shoot him. So later on that day, she hands the gun over, the murder weapon that was used to kill Abraham, and then she describes whereabouts he is buried. And so all three of them drive there to have a look, and it's at the back of a property which she owns. They arrive there and she points at a large patch of freshly laid concrete and says, over there. So Greg asks her to get out of the car and exactly point out the location where he is. She gets out of the car, she walks over, there's an iron bar just on the floor in the ground somewhere. So she picks it up and she goes over and places it on top of the concrete to map out exactly where his body is buried. Greg also gets her to draw a map. He tells her that if he's gonna be going back later at night, he doesn't want to get the wrong place or forget where it is. So he also got her to literally draw out exactly where the body was and she did that too. So the plan was that Greg and the undercover agent Fall Guy were going to be going back later that night to dig up the body because they didn't want there to be any link back to Dee Dee. Dee Dee thinks that this is a great plan so she's waiting in a motel for this job to be done. She rings Greg and says you can do it now, now is a good time to do it but a little while later she gets a phone call from Greg saying we can't go through with it because there are police everywhere outside this property and we can't do it. He says you're gonna have to come and meet me because we need to discuss what we're gonna do now. So she's freaking out and they agree to meet in a car park. So they get to this car park and Greg is sort of playing along saying have you set me up? And she's like no oh my god I wouldn't do that. And then an investigator shows up and gets them both out of the car and asks them both to go to the station to answer a few questions. So when they get to the station, Dee Dee is smiling and happy and she says to the investigator, oh my God, I'm so happy that you've got him. And the investigator is like, got who? And she says, Gregory. Then the police drop the bomb that Greg has actually been working with them for a long time now and she is visibly shocked and she can't believe that this is what is happening. So then she just starts talking and she says that Abraham died in a drug deal gone bad and then she tells them that it was this guy called Ronald and then she tells them that actually it was his cousin Cedric and he killed him in cold blood and she physically saw him do that. But then she changes her mind again and tries to tell the police that her 14 year old son, RJ, was the one that shot Abraham because Abraham was choking her and RJ walked in and just protected his mother like a good son would do. And I just cannot believe that a woman would try and tell the police that it was her son that shot somebody. Like, how sick is that? Don't involve your son in all of this, an innocent child. But after getting all of these ridiculously weird stories out of her, 
police now have enough to get a warrant to search the property. So the next day, investigators go to the house that Dee Dee owns and they start digging up underneath the concrete patch that she mapped out to Greg the day before. And it didn't take long for them to come across the body of Abraham Shakespeare. And he was buried about nine feet down underneath the fresh slab of concrete. He'd been buried wearing red jeans, a bomber jacket and a white t-shirt and he didn't have any shoes on. And also all of the metal from his clothing was removed. So the metal button on his jeans and the zip from a bomber jacket, presumably so that if anybody used a metal detector, they wouldn't come across anything that was buried. So it was thought out. It was well thought out when he was buried. And after an autopsy, his cause of death was determined to be shooting. He was shot twice in his chest by a nine millimeter or 35 caliber gun. Police found out from Dee Dee's ex-husband that she had asked him to dig a hole for her in her backyard for a project she was gonna be working on in one of her company ideas. She rang him up later on that night and got him to come back to refill the hole because I'm, she'd finished with what she was needing it for, obviously. So he went round, but it was dark at this point and he couldn't see anything, so he didn't notice anything unusual. Apart from the fact that Dee Dee was really red in the face and sweating and he just described her as looking as though she'd been like working like a mad woman. So she was just like tired looking. During her long trial, she would act pretty odd and she would shout out and act hysterical and cry and laugh and she was told off by the judge a lot of times for this crazy behavior they would show her the footage of when she was being questioned previously and she would just flip out and start shouting and going crazy she also told the judge at one point that she was getting her words all messed up because her tongue had an anaphylactic shock which is just a very interesting thing to say but that's what she chose to say. On the 10th of December, 2012, after three hours and 16 minutes of deliberation by a jury, Dee Dee Moore was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. During her sentencing, the judge described her as cold, calculated, cruel and manipulative. But she still claims to this day that it wasn't her that killed Abraham. She is adamant that it's not her. She usually goes with the theory of Ronald or that she just doesn't know who did it. But as recent as 2019, so last year, she actually wrote to the judge in order to get an appeal. And she said that she was sorry for anybody that she hurt by not telling the truth and that it was actually Greg Smith who killed Abraham because he was having an affair with Greg's wife. The fact that she is still adamant that it's not her after all of the evidence that just, to me, clearly points to her, the fact that she's still saying it isn't is just, it's a pretty bold move. I think there's not many people that don't think it was her. Some people are a little bit, not skeptical of Greg, but they don't always agree with the way that he went about things because obviously he pretended to be Abraham when he called Elizabeth. People are a little bit wary of that and say, well, if you chose to accept $300 to do that, like you must have known something was going on. But ultimately we wouldn't have this outcome if he didn't do what he did and he helped with finding out what happened. So it's a strange one. The fact that I had never heard of this case just absolutely baffles me because it is mad. There's just so much to it. And researching it I was just finding out more and more and it was just absolutely mad so let me know what you think let me know what you think of Dee Dee she has been in a few documentaries and things she's quite well known and well heard of now I just find it really sad that if Abraham had never won the lottery he would still be alive that's a really sad thought his children now have to grow up without their dad because of the greed of one woman if you enjoyed hearing this case and the fact that this is my new thing of true crime Tuesdays give this video a huge thumbs up that would really really mean a lot to me it would just help me 
to know that you're interested in what I'm posting. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And I will be back on Saturday with Scary Story Saturday. I think I'm probably gonna be reacting to some more random noting TikToks because I'm so into that at the moment. I will be back the following Tuesday with another true crime case. So make sure to stick around and I will see you then. Bye.